Did it ever cross your mind about wanting to go to WCW and WWF on a full-time basis? Well, well sure. And, and again, I'm one of the few pro wrestlers that blame themselves. Um, mm -hmm. I was not... I, when Jerry Lawler worked for me back in 2000 and 2001 and 99, you know, he said to me, we were in Delaware one time. And he's like, you, you, you had too much success too soon. Yes, I, I, I broke down the ring and, and set up the ring before while I was training in Memphis. So all the Memphis guys saw me, you know, setting up the ring and taking down the ring. I did pay my dues to some degree. But here, I, my first match, I'm winning. My second match, um, Bill Dundee doesn't show up. So I'm in this opening match, and I'm the main event with Jerry Lawler against Dutch and Rich Ro Rip Rogers simply because Dundee didn't show up. That was my second night in the wrestling business. My third night, I've got a character, and I'm going over as a babyface with the Beach Boys. And that also scarred me because I was like, oh, they're going to come to me. And the bruiser went out and found me, and I came to him and, and got me. Then Windy City Wrestling went out and saw me from from a, a bruiser's organization. And then Jim Barnett from WCW went out and got Johnny Ace, Pillman and Zinc, and I was the fourth one. And you want to talk about 10 ways to ruin your career. So Eddie Gilbert and, and, and Barnett hire me. I was going to get $150,000 a year for three years. I'm not saying this to be moan. I'm just telling you what my deal was. And they were very mm -hmm. excited because they were going to put me, transition me right off as a heel, despite how young I was. So I show up at the UIC Pavilion. They want me to come in, meet all the guys, which, uh, you know, which I knew a lot of them anyways. I show up in a cream colored suit, my white blonde hair, Porsche Carrera glasses, and a fake Rolex. You never go up to Ric Flair and say, I idolize you. I'm sorry I'm just like this, but, you know, I just want to be like you. They're bringing mm -hmm. me in. I, I would be honored if you took me on your wing. I kayfade him. I would never spoke to Ric Flair. He looked at me, shook his head. He looked at one photographer we mutually knew and just like shook his head. And about a week later, I don't hear anything. And and all of a sudden, uh, Paulie Dangerous, he calls up and he goes, have they called you? I said, no, I, I thought I was supposed to start next week. He's like, you better call Barnett. So I called Jim Barnett and now they made me drop out of college. I was at Kendall College in Evanston. And he said, look, um, it's not going to go. I'm like, what happened? He's like, well, yeah. Ric Flair basically said in the booking committee, they had a booking committee back then. Look this up. This oh. is legit. Uh, Ric Flair said in the booking committee, if you want to hire a Ric Flair ripoff, you certainly don't need the real Ric Flair. If you're going to bring him in, I'm done. And this was told to me by Jim Barnett, Paul Dangerously, Jim Barnett, Eddie Gilbert. Same story. And I'm not saying Ric Flair was threatened, although he does say that he was going through deep psychological insecurities back then. But what an asshole, an idiot I was to show up like Ric Flair and then not even walk up to him and say, you know, Mr. Flair, I'm sorry. I, you know, I idolize you. They're bringing me in. Please, will you take me under your wing? Um, you know, so I blew, what, $500,000 contract. Um yeah. Now, they brought me back in for weeks at a time to fill in for people, but I never got uh -huh. the contract. And um, even and even another instance, and I'm telling this for young people to listen to me. You know, there's a door called success. You have to bash it in with your, you know, with your feet and your legs. You just can't tap and knock and may I come in? 